I've mentioned a couple of times that one of the ways that astronomers think they might find extrasolar planets is through the interactions of the star and the magnetosphere that surrounds the planet kind of like what we have on Earth. And it's an amazing opportunity because not only do you discover the presence of a planet, you discover that the planet is protected by a magnetosphere and from what we can tell, we really need the magnetosphere here on Earth to have life. And so it's just one additional signal that there could be Earth like worlds out there. Astronomers have found one. And this is pretty exciting news. So my guest today is Dr. Joe Pesci. He is the program director for NRAO, the National Radio Astronomical Observatory. And he's responsible for managing a huge collection of radio telescopes out there. You've got the very large array, the very large baseline array, the Atacama large millimeter array, some of the most powerful radio telescopes in the world. And he was here to explain this research to me, but also just in general, the state and field of radio astronomy, and how it's making great leaps and bounds in giving us another way to find planets out there in the universe. So it's a fascinating conversation. Enjoy. So this idea of finding a planet by finding its magnetosphere is kind of amazing. Uh, what did that feel like to make this detection? Well, you know, so I didn't make the detection, right? So I'm I'm not the the, the principal investigator here. But it's it's a really great feeling. And and you know, exoplanets are, are difficult to detect, even though we have detected many many uh, exoplanets right everywhere we look we we've detected them and and there are a number of different ways that astronomers use to find the exoplanet all very difficult uh you know primarily because they're small right and they're small and they're faint and they're not uh, producing their own light there you you need reflected light and so the star is very bright compared to the to the planet and and because all stars are far away you know those little planets are very close from our perspective very close to their to their host star so this is another way of potentially finding an exoplanet uh confirming the presence of an exoplanet and you know that's all fantastic and so beyond the the aspect of detecting the exoplanet the important point here is that if this finding uh, holds up right and you know this is this is an initial finding and and it it, it uh there 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 may be other reasons for for what was detected we can talk about that later if this finding holds up right more important i think than the detection of the planet itself is that the planet uh potentially has a magnetic field and magnetic fields around earth like planets are very important for a number of reasons not the least of which is that that magnetic field protects the any potential atmosphere uh, on that planet from being blown away by its host star and this particular planet is so close to its host star that that, that you know is potentially an issue I mean, when you think about those other methods of detecting planets, right, you have the transit method, you have the radio velocity method, you have astrometry, the kinds of work that's being done with the Gaia mission, you've got uh, direct imaging, which is starting to, to come online. And they all give you the characteristics of the planet, the distance from the star, the radius, the mass, these kinds of, of things. But, but you're always still guessing about whether or not this planet is is habitable. And with that requirement of habitability, some way to protect yourself from the star, it just it feels like a twofer in this case, you're, you're both finding the planet and also finding that the planet is probably protected by a magnetosphere. Yes. Yes, that's right. And, and again, I stress that this is a an Earth like planet, right? So it's not it wouldn't be surprising that we have a Jovian Jupiter like planet. Jupiter size or larger that has an intense magnetic field because that's what we expect. Uh, but and and you know there may be life on Jupiter-like planets, but we know of life only on Earth. And so when we're looking at those Earth-like planets, that that magnetic field is just another piece of of the puzzle, piece of evidence that is indicating that yes, it's it's even more Earth-like than you know than than it could be. And yes, there's the protection. So it's the protection of the atmosphere and it's a protection of anything that's on the planet from bombardment by charged particles coming from its star and, and cosmic rays from, from space. 
So what was observed? So uh, what was observed was radio emission that was caused by the magnetic field of the planet, but the magnetic field of the planet interacting with the host star. And, and in fact, it was, it was fundamentally aurora uh, that was induced by the magnetic field on the star itself, right? So, so the, the, the exoplanet, you know, presumably has a magnetic field it's very close to its host star. It's a, it was a two-day orbit, and so, you know, very close. And this is a small star, so this is a, an M dwarf star, much smaller than, than our sun. And so it's in this, you know, two-day orbit zipping around uh, its small host star and with a magnetic field that is interacting in complex ways with the star and the magnetic field of the star itself. And so, so, you know, there's charged particles and things in the magnetic field, and they're emitting radio waves. And so that was what was detected with the uh, the very large array. And and you mentioned that it is, you know, a, uh, likely, it's possible, um, but there are other kinds of signals that could mimic this. So what are some of the other possibilities? If it isn't a planet, then what is it? Well, almost certainly the planet is there. Now, you know, uh, we have multiple detections of, of, of the planet itself by independent research groups. So it's likely there's a planet there. And, and this is an interesting system uh, that I don't know the, the nitty gritty of all the details, but there are multiple planets in this stellar system. So it's an, you know, it's an exo, exosolar system. Uh, the, the planet is, you know, do we have 100% uh, knowledge that it's there? Maybe not 100%, but it's been detected by multiple methods. So so probably the, the, the planet itself is there. The question is, does it have a magnetic field? And as, as you point out, there are other uh, possibilities for what this radio emission is. The primary one is that it's activity in the atmosphere of the star itself. And these stars are very active, and these M dwarfs in particular, they have lots of uh, stellar flares, the equivalent of the solar flare on, you know, on, on our sun. And in fact, they're, they seem to be a little bit more active than stars like our sun. And so, you know, it, it could be some sort of phenomena, atmospheric phenomena of the, of the M type star itself, you know, that's causing this radio emission. Now, what is arguing against that is that uh, the researchers have found uh, periodicity or re repeating elements of, of this signal. And that is modeled uh, as if it were coming from the planet in its two-day orbit, and that seems to be the best explanation for it. So that's really strong evidence that, you know, it, it's coming from, from the planet itself. Uh, I suppose uh, that you know, the, the planet could be inducing some sort of activity on the star due to its orbit that has nothing to do with a, with an intrinsic magnetic field of the exoplanet itself. Uh, that's probably less likely, probably more likely as some phenomena in the phenomenon in the, um, in the, in the star. And so, you know, until we get follow-up observations and, or we start finding uh, similar things around other, uh, uh, other exoplanets, um, you know, the, the jury is still out, but that's, of course, the nature mm -hmm. of, of science in general and astronomy in particular, of course. And, and we have other, you know, we have several examples of auroras here in the solar system. We've got Earth, um, Jupiter um, and Saturn, obviously, and then even Mars has a tentative, you know, uh, partial magnetic field that can generate auroras from time to time. Mm -hmm. And so is like the signature of this, you know, based on the radio signal that we get of this aurora, are we able to get a sense of how powerful it is compared to the auroras that we're more familiar with? You know, is it getting really extreme northern lights that would blow your mind? Or, you know, would you need a really long exposure camera to see it? You would likely need a long exposure camera to, 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 to see it. And, and, you know, it's, it's in the upper atmosphere of the, of the star too. So you're, you're dealing with that. Uh, the, 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 the reason that it's detected in the radio is that the star itself isn't, isn't 
emitting much in radio frequencies. And so, you know, something that is like an aurora or interaction with a magnetic field in, in, in some other way uh, is producing these radio photons and there's not much to compete with it. But if you're you're talking about the aurora that, that, that we can see visually, uh, yeah, it would probably very be very difficult to to see that if you were on the exoplanet. Right. Um, and then, you know, there's a couple of factors that I guess are are really useful for this this observation. I mean, as you say, it's an M dwarf, which we know are very testy. They send out a lot of these flares that can be as as powerful as the kind of flare the sun can send off. Mm -hmm. um, and then also the star itself isn't blasting out in the radio spectrum. So would you see something, would this planet be detectable around, say, more of a sun-like star? From, um, from, from this perspective of finding the magnetic field. Mm -hmm. that's a, yeah. That's a, that's a good question. Um, perhaps, right? If it were in, if it were in a similar close environment, y yes, yes, probably, probably. Right. But um, then it would be a, like a hot would be a much worse planet because it would be much closer to a hot star. Yes. Right. Uh, so, having said that, I mean, you know, so M, M dwarfs are, are cool, but you're in a two day orbit and that's, that's pretty close. So it's, it's, it's a pretty toasty place. I would have thought. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, hmm. Like, I know that there are some telescopes in the works that people are developing. You've got, say, the Square Kilometer Array. You've got proposals for putting a radio telescope on the far side of the moon that can really push into that long end of the radio spectrum. Was it expected that we would make these kinds of discoveries of planetary magnetospheres with the existing radio telescopes that astronomers have available? Or was this a bit of a surprise? I, I I think it's it, it's a bit of a surprise. Um, you know, in in hindsight, we can always go back and and calculate things and say, yeah, you know, we should have known that that it would be there if, if we'd thought about that. Um, I'm I'm not sure that the community looking at this or the radio community in in general, you know, was thinking that hey, we can you know we can find exoplanets uh, through this. Through this method, and you know, again, that's kind of a hallmark of, of astronomy, um, serendipity, right? So serendipitously, we we discover something, and it opens up a whole new uh, avenue of of exploration. And I think this is probably the, the the case of that. Now, I, you know, there's lots of there's lots of uh, variables that go into this. So, you know, this isn't going to replace the radio velocity method or whatever, but it, but it's another tool in the toolbox. And uh, for, for, again, not only detecting planets, but more importantly, detecting that magnetic field, uh, which is, which is uh, it, it's useful that it's there and that it has allowed us to detect this planet. But again, I think the more important finding is that we have the magnetic field, which, you know, one could expect that Earth-like planets are going to have magnetic fields as well. It's just that we haven't detected uh, you know, if that's not a ubiquitous detection that, that we find around all Earth, um, Earth-like planets. And so that, I think, is the important aspect here. Now, the biggest downsides of the radial velocity and the transit method is that you need to have things perfectly lined up. We've got it, you know, it's got to be star, planet, us, all yeah. in a line. And that's like 1% of planets work that way. Is this you know, is detecting the magnetospheres more forgiving in terms of the angles that you could set, detect the planets at? It, uh, yes, it could be, but but it also requires some. Um, I'm gonna say fiddling. We're not fiddling with things, but but it requires some um, certain classes of of orbits, right? So we're not going to be detecting uh, an Earth-like planet with a with a one year period around a G type star, right? That's just too far away uh, to, for, for this sort of uh, activity to, to take place. You know, you, that planet is gonna have a magnetosphere. Sorry, too faint of an interaction for us to detect? It, too faint of an interaction and, and perhaps not, not, a, not a robust interaction in, in any case, right? right. So th there, 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 there may be an interaction that's not producing 
photons that we can see, but there may also not be an interaction because you're too far away. Right. Okay. Okay. So in other words, another Earth, like, like, we would have a hard time detecting the northern lights from many stars away. At, yes, at the moment, that's correct. And so, again, you know, another neat way of, of detecting planets, it's, it's, it's probably not, uh, you know, it's not going to be in the top five methods for, for planet detection. That'll still be the, the workhorses that you've mentioned. And then, you know, we're, we're rapidly approaching uh, direct measurement of, of planets. I mean, I disagree only because you get that exciting twofer where you get the discovery of the magnetosphere, which... Yes. If you do find that planet in the habitable zone around your star, you have one additional assurance that it has some kind of protection from the radiation coming from the star. So, yes, absolutely. No, no, yeah. I, I absolutely agree with that. No, no, no. My point was that you know it's not. This isn't a new exoplanet finding method that's going. You know, we're going to find ninety percent of the exoplanets right going forward. It's a it's a novel technique, and and we'll find some, but it's the it's again it's that the fact that the magnetosphere is there and you know i mean we 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 expect magnetospheres to be there but until you observe them you know the universe is a strange place and and maybe other planets don't have them for whatever reason. I mean, that's obviously unlikely, but that, that's a hypothesis that one needs to test. Of course. Um, but but when I think about the solar system, that that there are radio emissions coming from the Earth, radio emissions coming from Jupiter, mm -hmm. radio emissions coming from Saturn, yes, heading out into the universe. And if we had a big enough telescope, yes, could we detect them? Uh, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. With, and, yeah, with, with good enough technology, absolutely. And so if we were able to build something that was scale up to whatever that size is, and maybe it's a 10,000 kilometer array, I don't know what the, what the actual size is. Sure. We would have this independent method of detecting these planets. We, we could potentially do it that way. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. That's really pretty fascinating stuff. Yes. Um, uh, what are the, what are the, plan? I mean, I mean, this research always seems to follow this path. Like someone was like, we found the edge case. We found the most extreme version of this scenario. In this case, a, a planet that's orbiting just a couple of days around its star. The star is having temper tantrums. It was relatively straightforward to find. Mm -hmm. How does this scale up to become one of those very established tool sets in the astronomer toolkit? Well, well, the, the the typical progression is that now we know this is possible, right? So teams uh, will go out there and and either uh, go through the archives, uh, which is you know why archival data are are so important. But they'll go through the archives, or they'll they'll plan uh, future observations, and so then that's how the progression is made, right? I mean, you know when when exoplanets were first discovered, of course, our capabilities were only for multiple Jupiter type planets because they were at uh, you know in in uh, very close orbits because they're the ones that are tugging and and causing their stars to to wobble to the extent that we can detect them. and and you know, until we made that first detection, that was theory. and then and then you show, yes, that's possible. Our technology is able to do this. Now let's, you know, expand our data set, our observations, and and build the technology so that we can do better. And I, I think that's the sort of thing we'll see here. But there are, I mean, there are missions like Kepler and TESS that are day after day looking for these transits of the of the planets. There are ground based observatories that are doing radio velocity measurements. Um, are there any comprehensive surveys of stars looking for these kinds of signals or is it like chance data in the archives as you mentioned i uh or or not not necessarily only in the archive but but you know directed observation um i am not aware of any yeah. surveys in the kepler tests in in the radio portion of the, of the yeah ne neither am i which is you know why i was wondering so so then if we want to find more of them, we need dedicated radio observatories that are scanning exoplanets 
for a for a Kepler like project in the radio, yes, it would it would have to be a dedicated uh, radio facility. Now, you know, presumably uh, the 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 researchers who made this this current discovery about which we're we're speaking, uh, you know, I think their their next steps. I I I will speak for them without without knowing what you know what they're planning, but I, I would assume that their next steps are going to be you know looking for similar exoplanetary systems and then try making the radio observations to see if they can they can uh, detect something similar and, want- and other groups will will be looking at this system to see if they can detect it independently as well yeah yeah i mean it like it just seems so exciting like that we have this new method of of detecting exoplanets that can pick up some of the exoplanets that are trickier to see mm-hmm. it's just a matter of both scanning long enough at the different targets yes. and having a sensitive enough instrument but like with something like say kepler or tess you can you can observe an entire field of view and yes. watch all the stars simultaneously yes but that doesn't work in the same way with radio telescopes does it no that's right that's right they would have to be individual uh you know, pointed observation at, 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 at each target. That's right. So you, so you need a different radio telescope for each star you wanted to watch. Well, I mean, you could, you, you could do it that way too. Yes. Yeah. That's, that's the expensive way. Or, you know, you could, you could obviously go around to each target, but, but yeah, looking at a, at a field of view, it, it, it wouldn't work that the way. That's right. Are, are there any methods to do these kinds of wide? Like I like look at the pictures from say Meerkat and they look like a photograph of the sky of the Milky Way, you can see the core of the Milky Way, and you can see these filaments that were previously unknown. And yep. up until that point, you just get a few little blurry blobs. And the resolution is coming online with these big radio telescope arrays. So yes. do you see us moving into this realm of surveys with radio telescopes in the same way that we've had with visible and infrared in the past? Well, there's certainly uh, there's a survey that's ongoing with the very large array uh, behind me here. It's called the very very large array all sky survey, the, the VLAS, and that is in it's it's a couple years into a uh, four or five year project, and so that is populating archives with you know, all, all sky survey in in radio uh, at the frequencies that the, that the VLA observes in, and you know it's. It's finding remarkable things now. Would it be able to? I'd have to sit down and and calculate. I don't think it would. It would be finding you know exoplanets like we're, we're talking about. But what it's finding uh, is double lobed radio galaxies all over the place. You know the the jets coming from the supermassive black hole and and they're everywhere. And you know we kind of expected that, but it's really kind of neat to see on an all sky survey that you know wherever you look there are these these objects. And it's nice to match those up with kinds of observations that you're getting from JWST and others in in other wavelengths. Yes, yes, that's right. And uh, if I can make a plug for a future uh, observatory, the Rubin Observatory, yeah. right? The, this this archive in particular, the radio archive, will be useful when Rubin discovers something you know that we hadn't seen before. We can we can go into the radio as well as you know the other frequency and wavelength um, archives and see if something was there. Yeah, and it, I mean, this is a little off topic, but but how do you sort of how is this shift to more survey based astronomy impacting the field of astronomy? It's I, it's having worked with archives uh, long ago, you know, it's it's a it's a very important element of of astronomy. Um, you, you know, even though most of our observations are lo- like looking down a straw most of the astronomical objects that are in whatever field we're observing are not the objects of study, right? And so, uh, you know, I have a research project and I'm looking at 10 targets. Well, I take an image on the sky and my 10 targets are there, but in the image, there's, you know, thousands of other objects as well. And so those, those data, those images go into the archive and 20 years from now, someone can go back and say, Hey, you know, uh, this, the, these sets of images were used for something else. I don't care about those targets, but look at these neat things that are, you know, in the fields that no one had seen before. So archival uh, data are, are vitally important and, and useful. And, you know, archives that are 
150 years old uh, photographic plates or whatever that, you know, have been around for 100 years are still uh, very, very useful. But but you see these papers where in the past someone analyzed a pulsar or a open star cluster. And then you see these papers where we found a thousand star clusters yeah. and we looked at them all because it was all in Gaia data. And yes. it's going to just get to the next level with Vera Rubin where someone's going to say, oh, yeah. we just looked at a hundred thousand supernovae because <laughs> it yes. was all there. Yes. And that's right. And so that database is going to be enormous and with lots and lots of objects uh, about which we know now and objects that we, you know, have no idea uh, that they exist today. Yeah. So I guess what's next for for this research specifically about the magnetosphere planet? Should we expect to see further, I guess, analysis of this world? Yeah. So further analysis, you know, confirmation that this is an actual uh, magnetosphere, right? And, and not just some other uh, astrophysical phenomenon that has nothing to do with the planet itself and then and then finding trying to find more of these and then you know once you have a set of them you can characterize the magnetospheres and try to determine how strong they are and and you know are are we seeing all sorts of different strengths for different uh for, for the same mass object and why is that and you know so you can make models about the 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 planet itself cooling off or you know, solidifying completely because you would expect that you need that molten core to drive the dynamo. And, and so presumably you can tell a lot about that, about the formation history as well. That's not, you know, that's that's a long way down in the future because we need much more data to be able to, to say that sort of thing. But but I I suspect that that's, that's, those are the next steps. Yeah, yeah. Now they can do the targeted survey of this object, watch it for a long time and start to build up this, this picture. Well, it's fascinating work. Jacob, so much... <laughs> Joe, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me today. I really appreciate it. And uh, and I promise people are pretty excited about this discovery. And uh, we will be watching very carefully as more of these are found in the future. Great. Well, thank you for having me. And thank you for your interest. I, All right. I appreciate it. Take care. Take care. You can get even more space news on my weekly email newsletter. I send it out every Friday to more than 60,000 people. I write every word. There are no ads and it's absolutely free. Subscribe at universetoday.com slash newsletter. You can also subscribe to the Universe Today podcast. There you can find an audio version of all of our news, interviews, and Q&As, as well as exclusive content. Subscribe at universetoday.com slash podcast, or search for Universe Today on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. A huge thanks to everyone who supports us on Patreon and helps us stay independent and keeps ads at a bare minimum. Thanks to all the interplanetary researchers, the interstellar adventurers, and the galaxy wanderers. And a special thanks to Jay Dennis, David Giltonen, Modso, George, Jeremy Mattern, Jordan Young, Tim Whalen, Dave Verbioff, Andrew M. Gross, and Josh Schultz, who support us at the Master of the Universe level. All your support means the universe to us.